Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Serpentine Galleries. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lewin. I am Curator of Exhibitions and Design here at the Galleries. And I'm really delighted to welcome Dezine and all of you uh, to this very special conversation between uh, Ben Hobson from Dezine and Simone and Andrea from Phantasma. Uh, they're going to be discussing uh, Cambio, our exhibition that's opening today. It's the third major design exhibition uh, that the Serpentine Galleries have included in their programme. Uh, and for us, we hope it's the first of many more conversations, uh, researches and presentations of design in the future. So we're really delighted to have everyone here and for this conversation to begin. I will leave you to it. Thank, thank you, you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's a little bit cosy in here, but we're also uh, live streaming it on Dezine's Facebook uh, and on Dezine as well to, uh, to hopefully millions of people around the world. Um, Simone and Andrea, this is um, uh, a design exhibition, um, but um, it's also a research ex exhibition. Um, I wonder to start off with if you could just explain to everybody the kind of concept behind the exhibition, um, why you're doing, and, doing it and, and how. You know, I think that uh, we must start from uh, how the conversation went with Ansel Ray Covers at the beginning and with uh, Rebecca. You know, this is, as you said, it's the third design exhibition that the Serpentine is doing. And when we started the conversation with, um, with Dan Zurich, he said since the beginning that he was interested in approaching design uh, within the gallery, but not from the product perspective, but showing more how design can operate at different scales and to show more the process, in a way the way you're thinking of designers more than the products. And so we departed from there and we thought that it would have been interesting to do a curated show where, of course, it is about showing our own way of working, but it is about featuring the works of others. The idea of starting with uh, working on the idea of the timber industry came about because um, you know, we wanted to start from a material, which is something that we often do, that uh, can be um, you know, entering the life of people in multiple ways so that people can relate to. Uh, but also, I think when we talk about the use of timber, we're also talking about the relationship with the forest and how we extract timber from the forest. And uh, trees are, first of all, uh, living species. And so it raises also ethical questions in uh, what it means to produce when you interact with another species with whom we cohabit on the planet. So of course, the, the ecological concerns are center in the uh, exhibition. Yeah, and uh, we started doing the exhibition more or less uh, one year and a half ago. And we did it with several uh, Simone Sal collaborators. And uh, first of all, with the Tunin Institute, with the Kew Garden, uh, the VNA, uh, some people that work with uh, legislation in the Anthropocene, uh, based in Amsterdam. So we wanted, in a way, try to connect as much as possible the discipline of design with uh, uh, the outer world. And your, your previous um, kind of big research project prior to this one was looking at kind of technology mm -hmm. um, project called Ore Streams. Why the focus on wood and the timber industry for, for this project? Well, a, a bit because of what I said before, you know, that this allowed us to uh, take a material which is very approachable. It has a huge impact in design and architecture uh, and in the life of people in general. And because uh, trees are living species, I also have to say that the ambition of an exhibition like this is not to be the end. This is also something that we discussed with, uh, with Anne Zurich, but also with Rebecca. You know, we always wanted the exhibition to be the beginning of something of a longer uh, process. And we hope in a way that this is an exhibition that has a meaning in this context, so more in museum context, but uh, we hope that maybe other industries or other uh, even more traditional uh, fabricators will contact us to engage in some of the conversation that the exhibition is raising, so to continue further with that. And I respond to your question uh, because the, with Aura Streams, we were hoping to move from an independent project, a research project, to something applied, for instance, within electronic producers company. But we, we found a lot of difficulties in making that bridge. And I think that starting from a material which is more traditionally associated, for instance, with furniture making, uh, which is how we developed our early career, it might help us to uh, do not only a project in this context, but also bridge out in the reality of the world. And you mentioned that 
the kind of idea was not to present your own work here, but kind of bring other other people's together. Um, I think the only kind of design objects that you guys have actually made is the kind of the furniture, the, the, the kind of mm -hmm. exhibition design. Um, how then, as designers, are you approaching this project? What, what makes this exhibition um, a, a design exhibition and, and not just a, a kind of a piece of research? Well, first of all, like everything that we are showing here, they relate in a way or the other uh, on the design discipline. Even as you said, the choice of material that we chose, uh, it, the, all the material, all the furniture that we built within the exhibition comes from a specific place in Italy, that is the Val di Fiemme. The last year was hit by a huge storm. More than 30 million trees has been practically fell down because of like this storm. And there is like a huge problem because if they don't remove it very quickly, um, you know, this can have like a huge phytosanitary problem in all the area. And of course, also a huge releasing of CO2. We chose that material, of course, deliberately. And in a way, it's also a, a kind of like a, a um, that, well, it's a design choice, you know, you, can, you could choose like a very fancy material while instead we choose the most humble uh, pine wood that you can find. And we also chose it because of the, the reason of the, uh, of the storm. So in a way, already like the materiality, this meta materiality that you can find within the exhibition speaks about choices that you can make when you design. But also I think the, you know, the more we work, the more we realize that, you know, we can as designers act on a product level, but the context uh, that design operated with is much more, is much bigger, it's much more holistic. And in a way, with an exhibition like this one, we can engage with this, the complex system upon which design perform. What I mean to say is we all the time use materials around us, but it is equally important to question mm -hmm. how we source them, where they come from, the legality of it, how, how the governance of this industry is structured. Uh, once you have this holistic perspective, then you, start, you can start to zoom in in more specific case studies. But we believe that this exhibition is a design exhibition because as designers, uh, that we like it or not, we find our, any, in any moment of our practice, making uh, choices Decision. that either support one kind of industry or another. And it is important to start looking at design from this uh, perspective. Like one of the first part of the exhibition are a series of um, forensic um, investigation into uh, objects that enter in the European Union. It's quite interesting that 30% of objects that comes from abroad, they are illegally sourced or they come from Ill illegally uh, logged um, forest. Um, it means that in any case, we as a designer, we should be probably more active also in understanding, for instance, where we choose a material to understand uh, where it comes from. So to be much more transparent in all the, uh, chain, of the chain of custody. Mm -hmm. yeah, chain of custody. And what you're talking about is kind of like going beyond mm -hmm. design as, a, as, a, as an object mm -hmm. and looking at the kind of political, economic kind of impact of that. Do you think um, when you're looking at that, does the fact that your background is in design make a difference? I'm thinking mm -hmm. it's quite the idea of like design thinking uh, mm -hmm. is kind of it's almost a cliche. Mm -hmm. um, you guys talked about kind of um, talk, looking at economics, politics through the lens of design. Mm -hmm. what, what does that actually mean? What yeah. do designers bring to the table that the economists, yeah. that the politicians, that the policymakers aren't yeah. can't do? It's it's very clear. Uh, actually, we learn uh, this uh, while working on this project. And there's different ways we can answer to this. Uh, what we realize is that often, um, because of a sort of a cliche idea of efficiency, we all work in a very compartmentalized way, uh, divided in, in sectors, and there is a lack of uh, knowledge sharing. And I think this is creating a lot of troubles. And when we see that, whenever we do this kind of research, what is lacking is a link between all these different parts. And as designers, we can do that because no matter what, the design discipline is linked to all these different uh, facets. Also there sits in between between extraction and uh, and uh, of the use of an object. So we have also a really privileged position in this chain. There is also something else to say. For instance, a lot of the conversation we had uh, for the exhibition have been with um, uh, scientists or, or people involved also with um, philosophy or in other cases with uh, legislation. But what we realize is often um, this practice, they are, um, of course, victim of the, the cliche of their own discipline. So for instance, scientists, they can publish scientific paper, which obviously are tremendously important, but they lack the platform where they can 
make association or question the role of their own discipline, for instance. So when we engage in a conversation with a scientist, for instance, he takes freedoms that usually he wouldn't uh, have because, of course, of the scientific method. In this way, we can, because of our position, interact freely with uh, different knowledges and possibly create these links we talked about before. Uh, of course, the role of this exhibition is also systematizing these informations and communicating it to a larger public. So, um, you know, there are different ways that design can act. It is about information design, it is about um, doing research, but also digesting that research, making it available for others. And these are all ways that design can, uh, you know, uh, help the process of developing more um, uh, ecological thinking. Yeah, something that I think is important also to point out that we tried in all the step in the exhibition to, to give like to the people that will come and to see the exhibition knowledge or to kind of uh, be able to deepen much more the, the, the knowledge. For instance, in these two rooms, we have two videos. One video is much more historical. It goes through the history of timber. Uh, while in, the, in this room, actually on the back, we have a video that speaks about the industry of timber nowadays. And on the back, we have like some small cubicle where people can, can access a website that we create, where we have all the interview that we conducted in this year of um, uh, investigation with different, different people. And then you can really go through all the book that we have been reading. So let's say that it's quite important for us, this idea of sharing knowledge, and it's something we want to promote and foster as much as possible. And when you're doing a research project like, like this one or like the, the All Streams project, which is, I mean, I suppose all of your work is kind of critiquing design mm -hmm. as, as well as being, being design. But how do you kind of square that with your work as mm -hmm. designers? You, you also mm -hmm. produce kind of more traditional design, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, lighting, furniture, that kind of thing. Um, I was reading your, um, uh, in the catalogue which you've produced, which has got a lot of the kind of interviews you were talking about mm -hmm. in it. Um, and you talked about, uh, like the origins of design from the Industrial Revolution and a bit uh, kind of um, st stood out to me, which was you talked about designers uh, premised on accelerating and the infinite extraction of resources, conversion into financial wealth, the externalization of wealth and environmental damage from the richer nations to the poorest. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty damning statement mm -hmm. about what design is or what design has contributed to. So. But that's reality, I mean, so in, that, that's a fact, I would say. I think that's a fact. And we are part of this, this reality. And, and then we are part of this reality. Actually, our daily life, it is part of that description. You know, whatever, you know, there is a section of the exhibition, for instance, that touches upon the relationship that there is between how the contemporary industry of timber is shaped upon the colonial past of, of a lot of countries in Europe. Um, that's just a reality, we have to deal with it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is indeed a complex uh, question to when you are, as us, in any case, a commercial design studio. So it's not that we're working as a, you know, in a university. We, we, in any case, we need to run a business. And we need to find a balance between our critical and research-based projects, our more commercial projects, and in an ideal scenario, these two entities should converge. To make them converge is very difficult, and in fact, it is a constant struggle. It's, it's not easy and it is not, it also raises ethical questions. You know, should I, if I, if we do something like this, should we do certain other projects and, and so on? Um, on the other side, I think the complexity of the, 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 the world we live in uh, forces us in, at least this is the way we handle it, to um, continue with these two different entities, hoping that at one point they will merge. In a way, an exhibition like this one is an attempt to put forward our interest in working in a certain way. And I would wish, for instance, to have uh, producers or companies saying, why don't you do with a similar approach and more uh, uh, internal research in our own production process? Well, or we are starting to get, get this kind of uh, request, and I think that's quite interesting because it means that sooner or later we will probably find the right uh, you know, company to, to work in the way we think is, is correct, at least for us. Mm. So it say, takes time, do, probably. Do, do projects like, like this one, do they lead to 
companies approaching you, asking you to help them with their, not just design a product for them, but at design the moment a system. It did. Yeah, but we are doing mo much more on a consultancy level for small parts of production, because for instance, we did the electronic product, uh, project. We have been contacted and we did some work for companies, but then when you work with a huge, for instance, electronic company, maybe you're gonna work only with a material and finishing one that maybe is like in London, while you know the design part is gonna be like in Hong Kong. So it's also very difficult in this multinational to kind of really be this holistic approach. I think we can have it with much more l lower scale companies and I think that's what we are interested in, in the future. But it's, it is a struggle and we don't have any solution, mm. honestly. But we are putting forward an interest and we hope that since you know, we, we did 10 years of career, in the next 10 years it will be the moment that all the thinking that we have been doing will sort of serve to establish more in-depth conversation and collaborations with producers. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, like when you have those uh, collaboration, it's one per life. You know, I really think about Enzo Mari and Danese, you know, like uh, Enzo Mari was trying to push as much as possible a company to really think about, for instance, the, well, the well-being of uh, the laborer. And, and somebody found Danese at that time in the 1760, it was like actually really thinking along with him. And I think it's very difficult to find those kind of like collaborations. So we're looking for that. And a kind of related question, I suppose, which is um, what do you think um, like exhibitions like this, what impact they can have in terms of making kind of change in, in the industry? Because I suppose it's all very well um, people going around and, and seeing the kind of tower of IKEA stools that you've got and how you've quantified the amount of how long a tree needs to grow to suck up the amount of carbon if you just, and, and what that equates to in an object which gets thrown away and is so disposable. That's quite a powerful thing to, to look at as, as a visitor. How can that translate to, um, to, to affecting change in, in the industry? Yeah, well that's a very good question and uh, honestly we also know the limitations of this environment. So exhibitions, they can also be you sort of a bubble in a way, you know, like you're in a museum space, you can make, uh, you know, you can critique the systems and so on, but we know that reality is, is, is uh, much more complex than this. But again, you know, when we conceived the exhibition, the idea was that it wouldn't work just in, in this environment and it would stop there. So for instance, you know, uh, we, will, we hope to continue with a project like this one, also within education in Eindhoven, when we, we have been teaching for a long time, also thanks to Will Sederis uh, over there, who invited us to teach the uh, Design Academy in Eindhoven, and later now with our own department that will start in September. So let's say, for instance, this will be, Cambia will be the first semester of uh, geodesign, the course we are gonna lead in there. So let's say that we, we try to expand as much as possible uh, this bubble in, you know, in other bubble, the first, the, um, sooner or later it will also explode and probably will contaminate each other, yeah. And do you think as being, I mean, we're in a kind of art gallery now and I think mm -hmm. this is the third design mm -hmm. exhibition that Serpentine's put on. Um, and uh, Hans Ulrich in his kind of introduction to the catalogue kind of draws a line between this exhibition and uh, work of uh, the artist uh, Gustav Metzler, mm -hmm. who's preoccupation with kind of environmental, ecological yeah. damage. Um, I think Handel was saying one of the first projects he worked on at Serpentine was, was, was a project with, with um, Metzler. It struck me in that time, not much has changed or like mm. the, 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 we still seem to be going on, on this course. I wonder if uh, an advantage of being a designer rather than uh, an artist is that you have that link with industry. You Absolutely. potentially could be having those conversations with the, the, the companies which were actually going to make a yeah. difference at the end of the day. Yeah, I think because the design is dirtier. I mean, dirtier in the good sense, the sense that we are rooted into the reality of where things are produced and where reality is actually really shaped. Um, and that's why also an exhibition such as this one, yes, it is within a museum, but I'm sure that visitors will be able to engage it because it relates back to their own life as citizens and as, you know, people living in the world. Um, of course, the, you know, as I said before, there are limitations in the format of the exhibition. That's also why, for instance, we also have a catalog that comes for the exhibition. We are building this website so that the information, the knowledge that we have been collecting is also available for others. Um, these are small steps and, you know, we should bear in mind it's not that we have, you know, the solutions or or that we are here as gurus of what is, you know, mm -hmm. ecological design or, or, you know, it's not our position. You know, our interest in these issues comes simply as a consequence of being designers 
and witnessing what it means to be a designer in this moment in time. You know, how can you not realize that we are feeding a system, that we are contributing to the pollutions of the planet, that creating objects, you know, you know, has has you know, has an impact for sure in the life of people, but it has also impact in the life of other species on the planet, for instance. And all these issues must be addressed. And we, we, we are not, of course, the only one doing this. And we hope that, you know, these issues will be becoming more and more part of the conversation of a lot of other disciplines, because that's the only way forward. And we've been talking a lot about kind of the um, ecology and the, and the environment. Towards the end of the exhibition, um, you've created a film using kind of LIDAR technology of mm -hmm. kind of a laser scan of the forest um, and it's kind of narrated um, from the point of view of a, of a, of a tree um, and I guess this kind of ties into um, like the, the Hidden Life of Trees by uh, Peter Volleben, um, the, um, the novel, Richard Powers' novel Overstory, which one of the characters in that is kind of based I think, <laughs> on a real life scientist who's looking into how trees communicate, looking at trees as as organisms, so we kind of, I guess it's the same conversation you might have around veganism. There's a kind of environmental argument for that, mm -hmm. but then there's a kind of moral aspect of like, should we be doing these things to, to, to these amazing organisms? What's your view on, on that? The, the video is actually a collaboration with Emanuele Cocha, who is a philosopher who wrote the, the voiceover. <clears throat> and he wrote a fantastic book called uh, The Life of Plants. And, um, the, the technology that you mentioned before, LiDAR, is often used to scan forests to um, decide how to do selective logging, which trees to, to cut. It's actually an interesting technology because it allows you to have a more um, you know, precise assess of what is going on in the forest. Nevertheless, it's still used for exploitation. We wanted to reuse it to somehow animate this tree and let the tree speak. The attempt that we are trying with, with that video is to somehow question really if the, you know, our role on the planet is really as a dominant species or even if our own life has been shaped by, by trees and not the other way around. Um, it is not a provocation, it's just a way of putting forward a, a question of um, wondering really, um, you know, if you think about how naive we have been for so long to think that, you know, we could keep on exploiting the planet and serving first of all, necessities, but also just simply desires of, of humans. You know, and we don't want to be moralistic because we all enjoy, you know, the sort of the comfortable life we live in. Nevertheless, it is clear that we cannot keep on thinking only of the needs of humans because we cohabit in a planet with other species that allow us to exist. And, and if all lives on the planet are interconnected, then it means that we have to develop a more interconnected way of thinking about design. What does that mean? Well, it's time to find out. We don't know yet the solution, but that video is trying to at least pose this question. Yeah, and also connect to other parts of the exhibition still in the same room we have. Um, we work with Guy Amazonas, that is this um, NGO in, in the Amazon that is actually giving like a GPS to um, Aboriginal to protect their own environment. And they do it actually most of the time through sacral uh, elements of nature like, uh, like trees. So for me, what is interesting there is that already like certain religion opposite to probably the religion that is the most common in Europe, that is uh, Catholicism. Actually, uh, so the more polytheistic religion are already considering nature uh, on the same level. Well, we are part of nature, so part of human, uh, part of humans. Um, yeah, so. I, I think addressing these topics is important because it allows us to, for instance, conceive different form of legislation, which exactly. is something that we are addressing with one of the installations. When we were speaking with Philip Papert from the University of Amsterdam, he was explaining to us how difficult it is to create governance of forests, because of course, you know, an ecosystem doesn't stop at the borders of a country. So, you know, when there are different countries that have to decide how to create legislation, but there are tensions in place, and of course, you know, the countries of the north, of course, want to impose often legislation on the countries of the south, but there are, you know, geopolitical issues that need to be sorted out. And with him, with Patberg, we actually, he wrote four different proposals, a different way of addressing international legislations of forests. And when you read them, they sound, some, some of them sounds almost banal, yeah. but even that banality is not in place. We get to a point also to propose something which is much more extreme, which is open for debate, of course, it is not, um, you know, something we are 
putting forward as a solution, well, where he wrote a sort of a draft of, uh, um, of um, paper that uh, allow trees to have right. uh, rights as, as humans, which sounds crazy, but if you think about the amount of work the trees are doing as laborers to provide oxygen, to intake CO2, to create the environment for um, other, you know, species other species, to exist. Yeah. then maybe it is not such a crazy idea to have, you know, to start thinking that the efficiency we have been following for so much time calculate only the amount of wood, for instance, we can extract from a forest. But a forest is much more than that. So these are all questions that are relevant and they ask for the rethinking, of course, not only of the way we design, but also of the way we intend our own economic system. And of course, that's something that we as designers, we cannot take, take up on our shoulders, but in exhibitions such as this one, we can offer it as a platform for other people to participate. Mm. When we, we met earlier this week in advance of his talk, we were talking about um, uh, the philosopher Bruno Latour uh, and his um, ideas around um, kind of the, the rethinking the whole political system uh, and kind of centering it on, on, on ecology. On ecology. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that historically we've thought of nature as a kind of inert um, thing that we can extract from. Um, now climate change is everywhere nature is kind of getting its revenge. It's, it's clearly a kind of a, a, an, an agent. Um, but I wonder, does that not mean that, that if, if that's the kind of the way we're thinking, does that not mean that design just needs completely rethinking from, from scratch? Well, honestly, if we're talking, in any case, basically daily, that probably our own way of living we need rethinking, well, as a consequence, then design needs to be rethinking. You know, design before being you know, the discipline, it's an innate human desire of shaping the environment according to our needs and desires. So if we want to keep on living on a planet, survive, you know, and, and, and outlive the, our extinction, then we must rethink design together with the way we live. So yes. Yeah, and it also can be much easier than what we think. Even like in these days with the coronavirus, that we have been forced, you know, maybe to not travel so much or to use actually the amazing tools that we use nowadays, like Skype uh, instead of traveling. I think you know we have already like the technology to kind of change certain habits. So probably we need to be forced. And well, coronavirus is forcing us, <laughs> and maybe also climate change, uh, climate crisis should change our way of living. You're too tight in there. I'm not sure yeah. how safe it is. <laughs> I mean, I guess that comes kind of the crux of the dilemma in a way, isn't it? Because um, coronavirus, terrible, um, but you see the, like, the pollution maps like in China yeah. in particular, exactly. and oh, the, uh, the, the, the air quality has improved much more. That's because production has, has, has stopped. Mm -hmm. It's taken a virus to, 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 to do that. Um, the, con the consequences of that is that the economy is tanking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, so it shows how much fragile is this economy because, I mean, like yeah, two it, weeks of stops is making like us really falling down, you know, like, again, the economic system is the one that needs to be rid of, first of all. Yeah. And, and do, you, do, you, do you see like a way forward in, in, in terms of um, like kind of striking that balance, I suppose, which is um, saving the environment um, but also keeping the, the economy, because obviously the economy tax that has pretty dire consequences yeah. for, for a lot of people as, as well. Of course, we have a limitation in responding to these questions because you know, we're not economists. Um, uh, and I don't know if there is a solution for this, um, but I believe that there must be one. I mean, I, honestly, you know, I would be very interested to have a conversation with economists, which we yet haven't done because I can't believe, we can still believe that this system is a sort of doable. Mm. You know, it's not even about sustainability, but we often talk about how certain ideas are utopian, but what can be more utopian to think of that our economic system can be based on constant growth? If you think about it, it's almost amazing. It's, it's really fascinating that we believe that we can constantly uh, expanding. It's, it's, I mean, I know the universe is doing that, but. You know, I don't know if we can be so naive to think we can do that too. So um, I don't have a specific answers, but the, the sort of 
the simplicity of an observation like this, it is obvious that this, this cannot keep on working. And, and there are you know, people working with the economy proposing other systems to evaluate the wealth of a country, for instance, and, and there's, there's a lot that can, that can be done. We had a lot of conversation, for instance, with Philip Adberg regarding, for instance, the, the wealth of forests, for instance, you know. So the, the, there are also programs in place, for instance, that, to consider to pay back countries that maintains forests instead of exploiting them. So to think about, well, if forests are working for us, they're providing services, why should we not pay back the countries that own a lot of forests for the conservations of their ecosystem? So I think there are ways that we can, you know, also on an economic level, start thinking of the complexity of the world we live in instead of sort of uh, have maintaining this naive idea that we can keep on with the exploitations of our environment. And kind of zooming back into to, to, to designers, obviously a lot of these problems are complex global problems. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think designers can do to improve things, to make, to make things better? I mean, we, um, Dazeen, a couple of years ago, did a talk in Eindhoven about like the Anthropocene um, and talking about how um, solu potential solutions and a kind of recurring theme there was that a lot of designers are very well-meaning, especially actually in Eindhoven, mm -hmm. where, you, where you guys um, um, from, uh, graduated from as well, um, but they're very small projects. So like yeah. lots of very small, well-meaning projects, but how will they ha have an impact? How, how do you think that designers yeah. can have a, a real impact? It will be limited, but yeah. actually to, to make an impact. Well, first of all, we need to treasure those very fragile narratives. First of all, so yes, they are small projects, but if you think of a problem as a body, you know, then you need triggering points like acupuncture. And it means that I think the smallest project is as valuable as the most, you know, revolutionary and visionary project. Uh, we should also, uh, I, I think we feel that it's important also to state because we also have seen in education how when you face, you know, hyper subject and hyper objects such as you know observing the wall timber industry which sounds also almost naive as a, as a scope but it serves because it, you, you can start to understand its complexity and there are different scales of intervention and again I think the, the smallest is equally as important as the biggest because it's only with this multiplicity of attitudes that we can we can you know contribute to uh, to change on a practical level we see also the conversation we have. Yeah, I think like, probably we need to kind of engage in different, com with different conversation with companies, like also challenge them to, when they give a brief, to kind of debrief again with uh, different requests. Like we are doing it more, more and more often. So we are asking companies like to be more transparent with us on the way they produce. So we are trying kind of to know more, to be, to be in the position to understand better the people and the company we have in front of us. Also, you know, it's not, when we talk about in this way, it seems that there is us and there is the rest of the world or the companies, you know, it's, but the reality is much more complex, much more nuanced. So we, honestly, we met also a lot of people that would like to do a transition, that would like to find ways of, of doing things that are much more durable, much more sustainable, much more uh, ecological. It, we are all struggling in this moment. I think the important thing is that there is a willingness from all parts to do this. Um, and I hope the next 10 years of our studio will be nurturing this, both in terms of education and also collaborations with, with other partners. And do you guys have like, a personal ambitions to engage a, a kind of at a, a bigger scale, whether that's, yeah. a, I don't know, an Ikea or a, um, yeah, like get involved in, in, in a company like that? Or do you see yeah. your role more on the margins to raise work? No, work absolutely. We are open for that. But, uh, you know, for instance, a, a company as Ikea, we know that they are extremely concerned with the environmental impact of what they do. Um, so, you know, when we also feature in a critical way also their product, it's not an attack. It's just saying like, well, this, this system of, of uh, you know, uh, producing at this scale, it's in any case a problem. We, it's, it's useless not to, to, to recognize it. Sure, you can say that it's democratic because a lot of people can afford it, but the scale of it is insane. So it's important to, um, you know, to also I think it is also important to have a constructive, a constructive attitude. We're not, we don't want the exhibition to sound like a, a finger pointing. It is not that. It's just saying like there are problems. We are here to 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 sort of put these these problematics forward and some possibilities also forward, and to, to trying to understand how to sort this mess out. 
it's not the responsibilities only of a few people. Well, there are some people that <laughs> have a lot more responsibilities of others than others. But still, you know, we see also with the clients we speak to, we are, we are all struggling with this. We are all struggling in our own studio. With, companies are struggling. Uh, I think it is important to have the willingness to, to grow, um, to love the troubling times in which we are living. I think we, we've got a, f a few minutes uh, left. Does anyone have any questions for Simone or Andrea that they would like to ask? Don't be shy. Great. <laughs> okay, well, I, I just have one, one more then, which is um, earlier you talked about um, this not being the kind of culmination of, uh, of a period of research, but the kind of start of, uh, mm -hmm. of, a, of a bigger project. So mm -hmm. with, with this project in particular, what's next? How, how do you guys take this, take this forward? Yeah. Well, there's different ways. One way will be the Geodesign Department, uh, Design Academy in Eindhoven, so as an educational program. And that's, that's the master's course. Yes, yeah. that will start in September. Then there will be, uh, we hope that other institutions will uh, invite us to continue and to exhibit this, this project. We are already in conversation with some, but we also have been in conversation with Serpentine saying that what we, we don't want this to become a traveling tour where we ship around the stuff, but it will be the digital content will travel. If it is within European Union or within Europe, maybe also some other parts of the exhibition can travel. But for instance, we're also in conversation with some institutions in South America, and we would like to make it contextual to there. So that basically, <laughs> the serpent has said, like, what is going to travel is our approach in the research more than the, more than the stuff. Um, and, and the other way that probably this project will continue is, uh, we hope at least, in conversation with uh, Producers. So in this moment, we are much more looking at the governance of the extraction of timber. And now we want to zoom in to more specific case studies, possibly in collaboration with producers. Can you give some examples of, of what you have in mind? Well, uh, we are just in conversation with some furniture companies, for instance. So it might be that thanks to the ex exhibition, we will have conversation with them on how to possibly produce things in their own line of products that consider some of the concerns of the exhibition. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's too early to sure, say. Sure, it sure. might also fail because it also happened a lot, you know, also with oil streams. We tried, it was a failure, but uh, we, we still believe that there is a value, at least as a methodology in the work that we have been developing so far with all the imperfections that it still have. But so far, the signs are more positive that there's there's a kind of life after this. And yeah. <laughs> yes, much more than when we did aura streams, because probably there's also the scale of the, you know, with a project like this, you can work from a small producer to somebody that takes, takes care of forestry to a company that makes particle boards. So you know, there's there's different scale of interventions and possible interests in this that can allow us to possibly and hopefully um, continue some of the research in more specific case studies. Great. Okay, well, um, join me in thanking uh, Simone and Andrea um, for, for this talk. Um, for the, for the, live, the live stream audience, the, uh, the exhibition opens to the public tomorrow on the 4th, so you yes. can come to the Serpentine Sackler <laughs> Gallery, um, come and see the exhibition. For everyone else in the room, uh, we've got a, a sneak preview of the exhibition. Um, so um, that will actually start officially at 6, but you guys can can hang around. And yeah, this is supposed to be a video, so... Yeah, so this, this will it come... It will come in a couple video. of minutes, yeah. <laughs> uh, and there will be some drinks at six, so, uh, yeah, hang around for that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.